Welcome to The Downside. My name is Jamarcus Arezi, and I am horse. Oh, he's horse. I am horse. Why are you horse? You weren't horse last night. I just saw you. It was started. I, I've, I've been, it's been many, many days. I went to this SNL party on Saturday, oh. and my body's not made for the SNL party. And to answer your question, Lauren, no, The Downside will not be on your show. <laughs> yeah. You need us more than we need you. Um, Wait, I have a question. Do you have shows tonight? Mm-hmm. You're going to do it like this? I'll be fine. Okay. You know what happened to me? I was at the cell. Don't worry, I'm not. It's uh, many weeks ago. I see that. I see that look of of has a. I I I've I've been mistreating my voice very badly, but uh, you saw me. I was at the cellar. My foot started hurting. Yeah, I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk. I I called Tove. I said I think I need crutches. We may have to go to the emergency room. And then it went away an hour later. And. <laughs> What was it? I, I take back all the sympathy I expressed for you that night. <laughs> I have never had so, like I was on stage and like I couldn't move, which you know is ninety percent of my jokes. Yeah. Is just the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. uh, what is he from Los Angeles? Yeah. <laughs> part of it. Part of it. I, it's always it's always good when you have a challenge. Like like if I can't yell, it's like oh cool. Let's let's see how I how the new way to tell this joke. Mm. The new musicality, mm. but I I could not pick up my foot. Weird. And then an hour later, it went away, and my trainer said, "Oh, maybe your feet swell." I don't know. Feet I think swell. death is coming. I told you about the guy in Seattle who said, "Come over. You can put yeah. your foot in my mouth." Yeah. How much is how much? He said, "Name your price." What'd you name? Uh, Tova wasn't cool with it. Okay. Because it never it never ends with the foot in the mouth. Wouldn't be cool for any price. That's what I'm saying. I I cannot. I think take, it's scary. He's I think, a Jew and an agent. I'm sure there's a price with which he would be satisfied. I think though that it would have you'd have to change the parameter. Maybe like to come do it at the show or something. You know, you don't want to go to someone's house. Yeah. What would you do it for? Be like, be honest. Like, really deep down, you go to a house. You don't know this person. They might be sad. You might see around their house where the money should be going. Mm. And they say, they say for an hour, thirty minutes each foot. For an hour, they're, they're going to pay a lot. Oh, I thought it was just you. Just put your toe in. You can read a book. You can do some magic. This sounds great. Hundred yeah. grand. Hundred grand. If somebody gave me a hundred grand. How could you turn that down? Oh, okay. hundred grand. Okay, five grand. I wouldn't do. I don't know. That's five. Nah, five too low. Nah, five's too low. Also, you do it for five I bucks. Don't think I would. No, I think ten grand sounds more. So then the guy. He said, would you, sh-? I don't think I talked about this here. He said, would you ship me some used underwear? Ooh. But there were specifications. I had to wear it for, now that's ooh for you, as opposed to putting the foot in the mouth. Well, it depends. In my mind, he's offering me 100K for this yeah. foot thing and like $5 for my underwear. But maybe I have the whole I finance. Think for me, the ooh about the underwear is the, I have to go to the post office. Like, yes. it's like the work. Yes. I have to like do work. I, like I hate going to the post office. You know, like that for me is That's like the one thing stopping you from fin. Like I'll work. give you my home address. You drive postal. here, and I'll give it to you in person rather than me have to mail something. So this real kink is just making people go to the post office for him. <laughs> I <laughs> loves <laughs> mailing. People are making a lot of money doing this, and and I think you you'd be you're good at uh, roasting people. Like I think you could do it. Like you could you could talk. Like you filthy fucking pig. Like Finn Dumb. I think you can do it. Oh, like dirty talk? No, no, not, not even dirty talk. Just like your filthy piece of shit. Just off the dome, <laughs> real like aggressive. You would have to have like, I feel like my, the problem with it, mine is I would write jokes for it. Like they'd be like solid. Yeah. I'd want them to be like really well constructed. Jokes. <laughs> sure. Well, I bring that up because early on, I, I one of my earliest paid gigs was when you turned down. Whoa. It was a roast. Uh, something Long Island, someone. Oh second yes, marriage. it was a bachelor party. It was a it was a oh, bachelor party. Oh my god, you turned that down! Wow, Harrison yeah, turned that the down. The money and, was not enough for what that was. And when they went from Harrison to me, this was five, six years ago. I was like, that's 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 like, oh, we couldn't get not to blow smoke up your ass. Oh, we couldn't get <laughs> Brad Pitt. Let's get Russell Daniels. Oh, wow, okay. like just a real. Yeah. <laughs> a real that wasn't about looks, so it was yeah. just about fame. No, I know, yeah. We couldn't get Josh Gad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get Russell yeah, Daniels. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit it doesn't make sense. But I, I did find the recording because I still I keep oh, all my no. I just find I just want to see if the beginning Oh man, I remember you called me after this. So uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I know a lot about second marriages. My father was on 
on a second marriage. He's now in a second divorce. So I know how these things go. You know, I, uh, I, was, I was talking to Zach because we both have divorced parents. The difference is my parents got divorced when I was seven days old. So in this case, you know, probably was my fault. I was talking to Zach, saying the worst part about having divorced parents is, you know, having to, to watch your parents date. That's the worst part. It's gross. And, but I told him, I told him, yeah, you got He has it easier though, because my dad is currently dating a 23 year old. No, no, no. It's so hard. Good for him. I don't even tell you for what he's got. He's got a lot of jealous guys at this point. I feel like it would have been more dignified if you mailed him your underwear. <laughs> that would have been. <laughs> Wait, it's was this the one where dignified. did you at one point make some fat jokes or something about one of the wives? Yeah, I gotta. I really need oh, to go no. through. This. No, 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 not the fat jokes about the wife. No, 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 no. Oh. I, I made fat jokes about him. Okay. Oh, okay. oh. I I met with his kid Zach. Yeah. And like I, I was I was going above and beyond. And yeah, I met. With I his, remember what the money was. That is unbelievably above. It was six hundred dollars, <laughs> which oh. for me to go all the way out into the middle of nowhere in Long Island. Yes, and yeah. do a thirty minute roast. Yeah. And I don't know what I thought. I thought it would be like a panel, like a, like a, a dais. <laughs> I really, I wore no, a suit. It was just a bunch of dudes yeah. in a room. I wore, you a, wore suit. a suit for $600. I wore a suit. Oh. And I was listening on the way over. I was listening to Eminem's Lose Yourself. Wow. And I was like, it was my first, 600 you remember the first. It's $600 minus the cost of the dry cleaning. Sure, sure. But the for you remember that like first $500 gig, that sure, first grand sure, sure. gig. Now I wouldn't even move for a grand. But wait, <laughs> um, you're in an empty room. Like you're just in that bachelor party room. So, or there are, is there other people at the restaurant here listening? So they they I, they brought me to this back room, and it was like a little private room. Yeah, and everyone was there. The last person to come on the cookie has to eat it. Uh huh. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> everyone there was wearing shorts and t-shirts, not suits. Not suits. <laughs> they were they were sitting in a circle. You did all of this research and talking to the guy, and you never said, "What is everybody wearing?" Yeah. I assumed batch. I don't know. I, again, I <laughs> I really thought in my mind like Friars Club. Yeah. And when I walked in, there was in a round table, and it was as it was as if they were doing me a favor. Like I was a nephew, <laughs> and they said, "Please, can he come in?" And they said, "Fine, but we're going to eat the whole time." And they're just they're eating, and I'm moving around. They, they said, do you want anything to drink? I asked for a Merlot. One of them said, do you want a straw with that? And everyone <laughs> started laughing. He wrote better rose jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had no cards. I mean, this is pathetic. Wow. And what they wanted is what I think you could have done. You go and go, ah, boom, you're gay. You're fat. Yeah. You're gay too. You're gay and fat. And that's what that's all they wanted. Yeah. For 30 minutes, yeah, which they is tough. Mean. Yeah. yeah. They, it's also a bachelor party. I think anytime... When you get those calls, you also, you also have to be like, hey, I feel like most of the group wants a stripper. Like, if I come in instead I know. of a stripper, uh, it's, a it's bizarre. gonna be the expectations versus reality. But this here. was second. This Whoever's was second. organizing it doesn't really know. But no, no, but it was second bachelor party. So these guys are 50. So there were kids, like, not kids, but there were sons. There were teenage sons right. there yeah. with their dads. So it's not like it's not like your bachelor party with all the sex workers and yeah, yeah. You're cheating on your wife. <laughs> but it was, it was, uh, so so I basically I made like jokes about him being fat and then he got annoyed. He was like, Whoa, enough with the fat jokes. Whoa. And I was like, I'm looking through my note cards. It's dozens, all dozens, fat. all fat jokes. Yeah. So I move on to his wife. I say, um, oh, Gary, everyone says you love eating out. Well, everyone except for your wife. And he goes, Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> his son's right there. And I'm like, geez, I can't make fun of your wife. And what happened towards towards the end is uh this joke, which I think was was decent enough, I said. Uh, I also hired a second writer to help me write even more of these. I said, "Oh, Gary's uh, Gary, your your fiance is always dressing to the nines to make up for the fact that she's a six. Okay, decent, yeah. decent. All right, Dean Martin, <laughs> decent. Well, you heard me. There's also early in stand up, uh, so I was talking like this, like yeah. really elevated, and and then one of his friends said, "No, she's a two, Oof. Oh. a size two, that is." Oh. And Gary went, "Oh." That was funny. I, we should have hired you instead of this guy. <laughs> and I was, I mean, brutal. Man. Let me just see it. I just, there was one last part that you really just captured. Oh, my God. Oh. So it was supposed I to did, be. So I, I did, because I was in the Friars Club, uh, mm. a lot of those calls come through because they're like, hey, he's in the Friars and I've done roasty stuff. Yeah. And I enjoy doing roasty stuff. Um, but this one, 
I learned my lesson on it. She was like, it's my husband's 50th surprise party. And so this one of the surprises will be that he gets roasted in front of everybody. And there was like a sizable crowd. Like there's at least 100 people in this place. And I was like, I need information about him. So she sends me all these facts. And after like joke one, I realized she has sent facts that she has not cleared with the husband. So I'm saying things he does not want the rest of the group to hear. Oh. Like one of the facts was like, we don't have sex anymore. And he was like very embarrassed about it. Oh. But the wife was like, that'll be fun to, to make fun of. We don't have sex anymore. And so I was dead in the water from the get. Oh, Were the friends laughing and he just looked mortified? Well, once the birthday guy looks mortified, that's really tough. And I love you freaking out. You're like, uh, I got these facts directly from your wife. Yeah. yeah. She said. Which makes it worse because they're like, these are definitely true. Oh. Now, how much? It was more than 600. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I was looking at the clock the whole time. I sure. mean, it was, it, I, I called eight people after. It truly could have been the moment that I quit stand-up comedy. It was, it was that low. <laughs> Jesus and and uh, Russell. Well, I talked. I answered the phone call that day. I remember. Did you Did you talk me off the ledge? Or did you say? What? I remember. I mean, I remember it being a funny story, but uh, that that is such a nightmare to go into. Uh, that again, it's the thing of people organizing a party where you're like, no one wants this. No yeah. one wants. And I warned yes. them too. Like, no one wants to stand me, up at a bachelor party. No one wants that. I think it was when they called me. I was like, I don't know if this is really the best idea. Like, let me give you some reasons, and here's some other suggestions. And they weren't, they, they didn't want to hear it. <laughs> no. I could have saved a young John Marco. You could have. All right. I, I know this is torture, but I just want to hear this last part. <laughs> I think this is, a, this is, this is, I ended five minutes early, which you can ask anyone. I've never ended a set early. <laughs> still never going to travel south below your waistline. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll get over that. <laughs> She's a, she's a, she's a, you're a lucky guy. You know, for some for some husbands and wives, the wedding night is the first night they have sex. But I think your wedding night is gonna be the last time you fuck. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So what are we laughing about over there? Guys, guys, stop. That was three years ago. <laughs> there you go. I love uh, wedding man. Oh, <laughs> Karen, I'm just kidding. I know you can't get it up anymore. <laughs> Start yeah, you're less doing Santa than facilitating a conversation amongst friends. Yeah. You really think that you spend more money on the way is the Seattle spills. Wow. I can hear the clinks of silverware. I know not, the microphone's working. They did not like that. That Seattle is cheap. They get you from China. <laughs> I heard it was Canada. Three years old, you know, sometimes when you turn down a gig, you have like I get very neurotic once I if I've ever said no to something, and I'm like, man, maybe I should have done it. Maybe that would have been the sliding doors where you I have... become successful. <laughs> this is one of the few moments where I've never been happier that I turned a gig down. This is there the are downside. so many moments. <laughs> You're listening to The Downside. The Downside. With John Marco Cerezi. Welcome to The Downside. Uh, my name is John Marco Cerezi. I, I'm repeating the intro. Uh, if you're tuning in, this is a place where people can get negative. They can complain. They, they, don't have to, they don't have to say why they're grateful. They don't have to pretend things are nice. And we'll support them in their negativity. Um, if you're a fan of the show, join the Patreon, patreon.com slash downside. You get early access to episodes, one bonus live episode a month, one bonus Patreon exclusive episode every month. It's just me and Russell and my comedy special, The Rats Are In Me. We also have a live taping coming up May 3rd for the Netflix is a joke festival at the Comedy Store. I'm here with my co-host, Russell Daniels, and our guest today, stand-up comedian, magician, writer, Harrison Greenbaum, thank Hello. you for being here. Thanks for having me. I think the horse voice works for you. You sound even more like a Kvetchy old Jew. I do. Well, I was because I listened <laughs> to your interview with uh, with Penn. Uh, but what is it, Penn or Teller? Which was it? Penn. Penn. And he. Yeah, the has irony a, is his name a, is Teller, but he doesn't talk. That's how I remember it. Oh, oh. that's I will now remember it. The same yeah. way Indica, Indica Couch, yeah, Boom. Sativa, whatever. Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. We need more of these. We need yeah. this for like Don't poke morals. where you joke. <laughs> what? Don't poke where you joke. Sure. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey. More rhymes. If people only knew that, the whole Me Too movement wouldn't even need to have yeah. happened. Uh, uh, so. I had to make them up for magicians, by the way. There's Don't Poke Where You Joke, which is, you know, don't shit where you eat, but for comedians. And magicians don't have that because they don't get laid. 
but I thought it'd be good to come up with some. So I have don't jizz where you whiz. Mm. Don't fornicate where you press to digitate. Oh, whoa. Wow. Those are a couple. Press to digitate. That's, that's magic. Is that, is that telling the future? No, no. Press to digitation is, uh, is magic. I've never heard that. Why did they need that extra word for magic? I have no idea. Thaumaturgy, that's another good magic word. I'm trying to rhyme more magic words. With what? Me. I'm trying to rhyme words with magic. <laughs> oh, God. Well, yeah. Do you want us to take a pause or? No. <laughs> um, well, I'm so happy to have you. Uh, I love having on uh, uh, magicians. <laughs> Do you, in your heart, are you a comedian first or a magician first? That's such a good question. Um, I always, my, my sort of point of difference, but especially when I'm trying to like tour my, I, I do like a comedy and magic show. And so I always say that I'm a comedian doing magic as opposed to a magician doing comedy. Because almost every other comedy magician out there is definitely just a magician with comedy. And I am a comedian with magic. So the whole thing is flipped. Now, without naming names, I'm going to say some magicians will tell you pretty baldly that they are also comedians. And they're full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, it's very interesting. when They're when, not. Yeah, but some of them think it. I, you know, that, I, so I have a book called You Are All Terrible, which started out as a lecture called You Are All Terrible. And I, it's a lecture I've done all around the world for almost 10 years. And there's a, the back half of the lecture is like how to write a joke, like comedy. Um, or if you, if you are already writing jokes, how to make them funnier. Yeah. And I will ask people to raise their hand. I said, who here is a comedy magician? And they raise their hand. And I said, now put your hand down if you've never written a joke. And hands go, a lot of hands go down. And then I, that's what I, I, I'm like, well, then you're not, if, you can't be a comedy, but magi- you can't do comedy and not write your own shit. Like yeah. sure. you have to know how to write yeah. a joke. How can you be a comedy magician or even call yourself a comedian if you've never written a joke? And so there is that disconnect in the, in the community for sure. Sure. I think there's something, there's just the distinction of like, especially what a stand up comedian, I've been thinking about recently, like where stand up comedy it's not just being funny. You have to, you got to really, there's a little bit of a surprise. The same way a magic trick like surprises 100%. you. 100%. A joke has to be surprising in a way that gets someone to laugh. It's a verbal magic trick. Yeah. I think it's an extension of uh, everyone just thinks that they are funny or that they can tell jokes. You know, I think it, it's for whatever reason, it's harder for people to imagine being a magician because they're like, oh, well, that involves some blah, blah, blah. Sure, sure. But jokes. Yeah, we no, can have funny with my you know, friends. Like, I think it's just like it further shows that there's just a lack of understanding and, and respect. <laughs> yeah, there's a cliche in the magic community, which is like comedy magicians, where they're not good enough at magic and they're not good enough at comedy, so they put them together. Sure. I hope you don't oh, notice. Funny. And so my whole sort of thing, like I did, I kept my stuff very separate for a really, really long time. So like magic was like, the way a preschool teacher would like hide her burlesque career, like pasties in a duffel bag. Nobody should know about this. Um, Cause I remember I was just, I was a baby comic. I was still in college. I was like barking for, for time, like handing out flyers. And uh, I was about to go on stage and I was putting sponge balls in my back pocket. And this uh, comedian comes up to me and he's just like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, well, if the jokes don't work, I have this like cool closer. Uh, the audience will love it. And he's like, you'll never get good at comedy if you have this safety net. And that changed my life, my uh, career. So I took it out of my pocket and I was like, okay, I have to do straight stand up or as straight as I can do it. Um, but I have to a do- direct metaphor. <laughs> like, yeah. like I think about that, like with a joke that I need to retire, but for you, it literally was a yeah. prop. Literally in something pocket. in my back pocket. Yeah. Did you ever get to do that though? Did you ever like bombing and you would do a trick? Well, early on, cause it's like, yeah. it, you know, you, I have this, these magic tricks that worked. Um, so then I, at that point though, I kept them very separate. I was like, I need to be able to do an hour of just stand up. And then if I ever put the magic back in, then it's going to be like a bonus. Yeah. And so that was really important. Like even at the seller, like I wanted to get past at the seller without them even knowing I did magic. Like it's got to be purely on the merits of my comedy. Like that was so important to me. Um, you ever have a, a trick go terribly wrong? Oh yeah. And when it goes wrong, it goes really fucking wrong. Tell me, tell me one time. Well, because the whole thing is a lot of tricks. Some tricks take a while to set up, so it's like yeah. that card has been signed, it's been lost in the deck, it's been shuffled. You put it in a cannon. You've done all this stuff, like, and then when you don't have the card, um, when I was in college, uh, they had a talent show before. Like it was freshman year of college, you were like all the kids get in like a week or two in advance, so you had this what they call like camp pre frosh like. You you have a week at college without having to worry about classes. It's just having fun and meeting people. So they have a talent show and it's Harvard. So everybody's type A. So it's like the best violinist in the world, the best whatever in the world. So I did some close up magic 
at the audition, just to the judges, like card tricks. They're like, great, those were amazing, you're in. And then they put me on this giant stage outside in front of 2,000 kids or whatever it was. Uh, and I was like, oh, this doesn't scale up. There's no, like, yeah. what am I going to do? So oh, I tried no. to do a trick called card on ceiling, which is where you like, they pick a card, you throw the cards up and the card sticks on the ceiling. Um, but there is no ceiling. We're outside. So I'm like, I'm just going to do it horizontal. And so I throw the cards against a door and we're, we're on the steps of what's called Mem Church, Memorial Church. So I'm throwing a thing at the church. All the cards go at the church door. Uh, when the call, cards fall away, there is no card stuck to the door. There's nothing. And so I just start riffing. And that was sort of my first ever like stand up comedy experience. People were like, oh, that was such a funny gag that you did. And I was like, oh, this comedy stuff is really fun. <laughs> but yeah, the cards just didn't. So you never, you, you just riffed your way out of it? I riffed my way out of it. Did it work or was it was the crowd it, like, it did what work. was the whole fucking card part? Yeah. For? Well, I made it, I made fun of the president of the university. And so that people were like, holy shit. And I have school hasn't even started yet. I'm on a microphone in front of every kid being like, oh my God. Larry Summers was supposed to come out the door and catch the car. That son of a bitch. Yeah. Uh, so like I'm, and then uh, what made it crazier is I had done this trick where there's a bunch of sponge balls. Um, and this lady opens her hand and there's like hundreds of sponge balls everywhere. And I'm like, you know what? That's the cost of the show. I'm not going to pick them up. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'll just get new ones tomorrow, you know? Sure. So they're all over the steps. I finish the set and I'm like, you know what? I want those sponge balls back. So I'm going to like crawl very quietly during the next act. Cause they're along the steps and try to pick up as many as I can, but I get really nervous. I'm like kind of running, but like in a squash position. So I fall during this other, some like opera singer is singing. Uh, and I tear open my knee. So I'm bleeding everywhere, oh. holding these sponge balls. I go back to my seat and the guy next to me goes, I don't know about that last trick you did, but that blood thing looked fucking amazing. <laughs> oh my God. Um, now I've always been interested because I I I know you've uh, dealt with it. The the code for magic and the code for comedy. There's all these parallels. Yeah, and then there's all these you know the, the ways that it's very different. But talk to me about, and it's a downside. So you complain as much as you want. <laughs> when it comes to inventing, naming a trick, uh, inventing a move, like how does this whole process? work do you submit it to someone have you had is there a move that is your thing that you came up with that would be fun if i was like oh the old greenbaum subterfuge uh the, that's been a big sort of um thing for me is that i think the rules of comedy and the rules of art where you create your own stuff you start with an idea and then you use technique to bring it to life and you put that through your point of view that's sort of the simplest version of that right yeah um, I feel like magicians do it backwards. And so my big thing about the lecture and the book and this whole thing is trying to get them to think more like other artists and comedians. Cause I think magic should, should be the same way. Right. So you should come up with an idea and then figure out how do you make that magical? Like all the best magicians do that. Um, like all the real greats, your sure. car fields, your I mean, cause like tellers, Russell all those people. is a great comedian, but it's basically, he took it from Chris Farley. <laughs> Almost every aspect <laughs> Yeah, I started at the end point and then just worked backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's, I mean, there is a, ma you can go to the magic store or now you go online to magic stores online, but people will buy a trick and it comes with a DVD or download of the person doing the trick. It comes with the script and the jokes. And so these people are just cover bands for the people who actually yeah. created the material. And then those people, because that's happening for so long, some of the people creating the material are barely changing somebody else's thing and re-releasing it. And so it's these like copies of copies of copies. And so I'm, most art forums, there are cover bands. Comedy, I think, has some of the fewest. It's very, I, I don't know, it's really hard to do that. I think it's maybe 0%, right? Um, in music, there are cover bands. There's like, you can be a journey. Well, comedy, cover let band. me just say there are. I mean, it's it's bottom of the barrel. I sometimes wish there were more because I think it's, I'd rather. Gallagher, I'd, too. <laughs> there, if you go to, uh, what is it called? Something salad, uh, gig salad. Yes. You can yes. get like a Rodney Dangerfield. Oh, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Or you can get, and I. A Joan Rivers. Listen, yeah. there's some comedians that I would much rather them hear them regurgitate Seinfeld than yeah. any of their act. Yeah. I think it would be cool to have more comedy covers. I'm, but I, I think it's admirable that there are bad comedians doing their own stuff. Like you don't, like that, that's good for an art form. That means they're trying maybe, and, and some of those bad comedians become great comedians yeah. later. Like, 
We've been but around Rodney's long jokes, enough to see Rodney's that. Rodney's jokes are so. I mean, there's definitely people that are influenced by. Oh like, sure. Oh, hundred like, percent. You know, in a way that's like so like identifiable. You know, like, right? Oh, like, yeah. hey, that's you're basically doing this yeah. person's style yeah. for sure. There's a lot of Dane Cook when Dane Cook was yeah. at his peak. A lot of Mitch Hedberg's. They're still they're still out there. There's some people yeah. that I'm like, this is a little Daney, but that's fine. Yeah. Uh. So okay. So you want Magic to have less. I'm trying to understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah, so my whole thing is like, hey, you can create a magic trick. So you can sit down and come up with a cool idea and then figure out how to make... Like, most of the tricks in my show, I write the script first. So I write all the jokes and then I just kind of put in brackets like, and then that is their card. Or like, and then that is their thing. And so then I have to sit down and figure out how... I'm not a wizard, so how do I make this happen? Whereas the typical creative process for a magician, I shouldn't even call it creative, but they just buy the trick... And the trick, you know, has Asian letters on it. Yeah, so they yeah. say, I found this on my trip in Japan. And then they just do the thing out of the box. But then do yeah. people have have things where they go, I came up with this move. I, I was the one who realized you could put the card in your asshole and then pull <laughs> it out of your ear. Like, is there, well, are so there, there new are... techniques being invented? Yes. So there's new techniques, new tricks. Um, Technology has always been a major part of magic. Um, so magicians tend to be very much ahead of the curve with that stuff. Um, the famous story is Robert Houdin. Um, so he's like in the 1800s. I hope I'm getting this correct. Um, there's a, about to be a war between France and correct. Algiers. I think it is. And so they send Robert Houdin because they believe in real magic, like shamanistic kind of magic. Mm. So they send Robert Houdin because they think maybe we can stop this war if they think we have more powerful wizards. So they send wow. a magician and he has this trunk. And, and they know he's a magician. Well, they say he's our, he's our, he's our wizard. Right, sure. like so you can put your them. wizard against our wizard before we go to like violent battle. So they they show they they we want you to meet this guy, and so Robert Houdin is like, watch this, and he takes, um, he has the strongest. He has a little girl come up and pick up the suitcase, and it easily the the box comes up, and then he goes, I can steal the strength of any man. Send me the strongest man of your tribe, and he tries to pick up the box and he can't, and then uh, he goes back to the girl. She can pick it up. And like, oh my God, they have the ability to take our strength. We can't fight these people. And it's just an electromagnet in the table that he can switch on and off. But that at the time was so technologically advanced. Uh, these guys had no idea. They thought it was magic, like real magic. Wow. Well, they should have had the warrior war. go up and punch him in the face and go, oh, guess <laughs> this guy's pretty easy to beat. Right. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what's so interesting about like the history of magic is like there was a long era, and still to a degree, of yeah. magicians getting away with some crazy shit because people thought they were real. Like, like I, I've always, I've talked about how Houdini was was very much, he didn't believe any of the woo-woo-y stuff. You, you can yes. correct me if I'm no, wrong. No, that was huge for him. And he was friends with Arthur Conan Doyle who came up with Sherlock Holmes. And Except Arthur, Arthur Conan Doyle believed in that stuff. Believed, That's why there was a schism. So Arthur Conan Doyle, these, these little girls, they, they said they found fairies in the woods. Uh-huh. And and basically they were paper cutouts, but they took a good picture, sent it to Arthur Conan Doyle. He went down to investigate the guy who invented Sherlock Holmes, and he believed it, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. And when they admitted that they were lying, he believed it, hook, line, and sinker. Meanwhile, Houdini, uh, who was always trying to debunk shit, he said, like, I, I have a secret code. I put on a piece of paper in a lock. If you can talk to the dead bring me back, I'll tell you the code, you can get the paper, and that never happened. It was even easier than that, though, because Arthur Conan Doyle was like, I had these people, they're real, and he's like, all right, show me any of these people, I will tell you how they do it, or I will disprove them immediately. This is like, this is literally child's play. So he he goes, and he famously loved his mother, and so anybody worth their salt knew that he missed his mom. Uh, so the spiritualist, I'm talking to your mom, and I'm sent, and go, what's the message from my mom? And the mom sends this whole message, I love you, and I've always loved you. And Houdini's like, obviously you're full of shit. If they did that with my mom, I'd be like, not my mom. Yeah. <laughs> Ha-ha! Yeah. You are incorrect. Uh, but she never spoke English. She only spoke like, she was an immigrant. Uh, so she, the fact that she was communicating through English, he knew that it could not have been, anybody who knew his mom or was actually talking to his mom would not be conversing in English. Yeah. Because the real psycho would be like, she's saying something in Yiddish? I don't Yiddish? know what the fuck she's saying. I don't know she's saying, yeah. yeah. Like, oh my God, mama. Uh, something punim? <laughs> could you could you do uh, cold reading? Uh, cold reading, that's a term? I've done it on, it's on YouTube. I, I've, I've cold done, reading is what the yeah. psychics do. If, yeah. I see a, a mer, 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 Mary, Mary. Yeah. You, you've done it. I've done it. I've, I've tried to debunk it multiple times, which crazy is it always like rears its head. It's like, is it true that there's like 
like a f- people can study face. There's like a face thing where you can study like 200 different like things in a face to try. What's and- amazing is you can study all this stuff, right? So you can train yourself for years where like you can sit down and do true cold reading. I've never met the person, but I need to convince them that either I'm a psychic or I, I talk to the dead. Mm-hmm. They're all the same skill set. So you can do that. The thing is the people that you see on TV, like your Tyler Henry, who like talks to celebrities mm-hmm. and finds their dead people. He doesn't have to be that good because like we have Google and it's on TV. So if like, once you're allowing editing, once you're allowing like the fact there's producers who are asking you for your emergency contact, like there's so many, we can, you can, there was guys that would bug their waiting area for their te- television taping. And then they would oh. put people that weren't, that were actually a part of his staff. Like there was all those TV shows back in like the 90s, 2000s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's the one that South Park made fun of really? John hard? Edward. John Edward. Yeah. Oh yeah, John uh, Edward. But it's the same with like crowd work clips where people will comment, wow, you never miss. And I'm like, I don't post 30 the minutes of non-laughter. Yeah, yeah. most list. of my shows, yeah. 30 minutes of non-laughter. And then right in the end, I get one joke in. I'm like, TikTok, boom. <laughs> um, so you did it to people. So I did a YouTube clubs. video. I did a YouTube video where I, I talked to the dead and I then I I revealed that I can't actually talk to the dead. But the idea was, hey, let me put this video up. This is like early days YouTube stuff. So like went viral for whatever. Like it was on Yahoo News, which was a big yeah. deal for me. Um, and so I thought, okay, that'll do it. And then I produced a show for ABC called Would You Fall For That? And I produced a whole segment. And this had like, we had millions of viewers, um, most of them in nursing homes. But we had like an airport. So That's I'm, rough to show this one to the nursing home people. Right? Hey guys, just so you know, a couple years, you're going nowhere. Yeah. yeah. Cause they're like, we have 3 million viewers. And I'm like, weird. Nobody I know has ever seen this show. They're all 3 million years old. Yeah, exactly. So, but it was called, would you fall for that? And we did a whole like debunking horoscopes and cold reading, all that stuff. And it doesn't matter how many times you put that shit out there. These, a new version comes like Tyler Henry is like the newest one, but there'll be, a, there'll be somebody else. There's always somebody because people want to believe and I, those yeah. people who take advantage of them are pieces of shit. Are you able to, I was, I was at with a group of friends recently at a house and this woman said to the group, have you guys noticed like ghosts around here? Cause I, I felt something over in that room and I, it was one of those moments I had to just go, okay, I just don't participate. Let, let them have fun. Are you an obnoxious Debunker. It depends. I mean, like, because also the placebo effect is real. So, like, chiropractic is like not real. Um, it has no foundation in science. Um, but like, if it makes you feel better, maybe. But like, there are chiropractors who are like doing it to children. That's really bad. And animals. Yeah. I mean, animals bad. Um, or they're doing kind of alignments that can actually cause. There are negative repercussions to that. And because there are no positive repercussions, it does feel like somebody should step in and be like, hey, the only thing that can happen is there's only downside. But clearly, no progress seems to have been made No, in and the history like, of the world. And I should say the caveat is chiropractic, when it comes to like making your back feel a little bit better, like human touch and basically massage is is helpful and at least in the short term. So there are like tiny minor benefits for very specific parts of the body. But like when a chiropractor tells you, Oh, I can fix your eating disorder. Like he's full of shit. Mm -hmm. He's doing like, you know, that reflexology, which we, we dismiss that, right? When you see those, like the thing with the feet, like, Oh, everything in your body can be explained by a touch point on your foot. The guy who invented chiropractic was like an American guy and his son. They had ended up having a fight because there's two schools now of it. Um, but they basically just move the foot stuff to the spine. They're like, it's the foot stuff is dumb. It's got to be the spine. Uh, That's the only change. Um, and there is no, there is no scientific backing really. Wait, yeah. one, one last one. That I just want to, if you know about this one, um, it was a, it was a psychic who would bring, uh, widows, husbands back to life. And he was famously endorsed by Kubler-Ross um, the, the German psychologist came up with the five stages of grieving, I believe. Mm. And uh, she endorsed him completely. He had these widows over. He would become or uh, bring back their dead husbands and fuck them. He'd ah. fuck them. And, and they say that he had cheesecloth. Like that was the technique. Cheesecloth was a big one, yeah. Because cheesecloth, you can, you can jam it in small you can they they it, that's where the word ectoplasm comes from like we all know it from ghostbusters uh-huh. but ectoplasm was like a real thing back then quote unquote and it was really just like wet cheesecloth i'm like no no this is like the the physical evidence of ghosts but is it because they could they could fit like enough to cover their body like in a orifice to pull it out it was easy to pull out and also it felt i think it was 
hard to identify what it was when it was like wet and dark. Like those are the things that happened in the dark. Like the big thing about spiritualism that people forget and like when Houdini was debunking it during that era, it got really sexy. So it'd be like a hot girl who like basically have to get naked in order to do this. And so all these guys were like, I totally believe in spiritualism. Like, yes, I would, I need to hang out with these mm. naked women more. And so that was also fueling the spiritualist movement yeah. was that they were like, wait a second. So you mean this hot lady is going to moan for a while? Yes, I believe in it. So, so this guy was very successful and he was endorsed even after he was debunked, this Kubler-Ross endorsed him. But, but see if you can guess what, what finally uh, made people start doubting him, made the women. Ooh. That they weren't actually fucking their dead husbands. That he made them come. Ah, <laughs> uh, my Moishi never made me come. This is unrealistic. They all got the same. They all got crabs. Uh. And they said, that's so weird. All, all our ghost husbands, they all have crabs. <laughs> what a coincidence. They're ghost crabs, though. Ghost crabs. Are, were these all old widows? I don't. I, like, I don't know how old. Was he just fucking old women? Like, you know what I mean? Was that his thing? But that's thing? part of it where or... you're like, maybe this was all just an agreement. And he said, hey, I'm into this, but I don't want people to know. I don't want to do it unless I, my eyes are covered with some kind of cloth. And you want to fuck? Oh. And let's all pretend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You yeah. still believe in ghosts, though? I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm never going to be sure about anything. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I uh, there's this one one thing that I I asked your permission before I would bring it up, but you, I mean you've done a lot of you've done a lot of shows, and and you've done some reality competition shows. Which I've been scary. eliminated from everybody's favorite reality television shows. Really, you have a competition show. America's I've been eliminated from it. America's Got Talent eliminated. Last Comic Standing eliminated. Fool us, they taped me. They didn't even air me, which is just me getting more efficient at being eliminated. <laughs> I'm three for three, baby. When were you on America or uh, Last Comic Standing? Oh God, I think 2017. Which one hurt the most? None of them really hurt. Like that was the thing. Is like, I remember when I got eliminated from America's Got Talent. They really tried to make me cry. They're like my grandmother had just died, and they're like, "What would your grandmother think?" <laughs> they're like, "Wait a second, I can see your grandmother yeah, behind exactly. you," yeah. and you're like, "I know this shit." Yeah. Yeah. They're like, what would your grandmother think? I'm like, she'd be very proud that I even tried. Like, what? Uh, yeah. what is, um, That's so shitty. Yeah. That's so it's shitty. really shitty. Who said, who, Simon? No, no. One of the producers backstage was trying to get me to cry during like a post interview. Yeah. It's like, what would your grandmother think? And I was like, I don't know. At that point, I was angry. Was, so I was like, she any was never on America's get, Got Talent. So. Yeah, any, any chance you had of getting me doing anything emotional but went out the fucking window when you did that. That is so god. These fucking um, these monsters. Yeah. What did you do? Magic and comedy? No, I just did comedy. Okay, yeah. Um. Oh, and the, but to your point of like, was I ever upset? No, because I was like, as long as I felt, as long as they let me do a good set on TV, and people could see, hey, look, that's funny. Um, that's all I cared about. So like, America's Got Talent, they put my stand up in front of millions of people. Great. Last comic put me in front of millions of people. Great. Yeah. Would I love to go all the way? Absolutely. But I'm a super competitive, high-strung Jew. But, like, uh, I was happy to appear. So do you mind if I play a portion of this Norm MacDonald? Well, let me set it up, actually. Set it up. Yeah. So last time McStanding, they, 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 they booked everybody that was going to be on the show. They're like, hey, we want you to be on last time McStanding. Great. Uh, at that time, America's Dead Talent and Last Comic were both sort of sniffing around. So I was like, let's do Last Comic because that's built for comedians. Yeah. Mm. That's going to be a more fun experience than AGT just because this is built to do stand-up. The comics were like, for the comic community, because I wasn't doing comedy then. Yeah. Like, did they, was it like, fuck, yeah, you got a Last Comic well, standing? I, back in the day, it was a really, really big deal. Like, the early, early days of Last Comic, because it was, I remember watching it as like, in high school, being like. I watched that for a season. Did you watch that fan? And uh, that I fan, remember yeah. it, yeah. Like, Gary Goldman, that was like the first time I became yeah. a fan of Gary Goldman instantly when I saw him on Last Comic. I was like, this guy's so funny. Yeah. Like, I remember those comics. I'm like, I want to do that for, you know, that kind of thing. So, like, they call me up, and then the network was like, we're going to cancel it. It, it. We're not going to actually do it. And I was like, great. Well, I gave up all these opportunities, but sure, sure, sure. Then they call us back, and they go, it was supposed to be 16 episodes. 
we're going to do it. The network said we could do the show if we do it in eight episodes. So it's going to be in this hyper accelerated timeline. And we're like, okay, so that's less screen time for everybody, but fine. So we're just going to start the show and say, these are the hundred best comedians in the United States. We're not going to do a cattle call. We're not going to do it. We're just going to say, these are the hundred best. And we're going to see who's, you know, we're going to, we're going to piss off so many people in one fell swoop. (laughs) Oh my God. So there's no cattle call. There's none of those episodes where they're like going to different cities. They're all from New York and then some from LA. Like you're like, there's, (laughs) so we're just going to fly you out to universal studios and you're going to do this thing. So we're like, okay. So they fly us all out. It ends up being really fun, right? Because it's 100 like professional comics. We mostly all know each other. Yeah. Just like getting drunk in a hotel bar. So like that part's great. That I'll, is really cool. Who else? Yeah. yeah who else are we, you talking about like during this I time? think Sam Morell was there. Um, who else was there? Mehran was there. Um, there were some like good people out yeah. there. And Jessenick's hosting this season. Oh, okay. Jessenick was hosting that season, which was out, was a negative, and I'll tell you why. And okay. I, I love him, but I'll tell you why that was Please, I'll hear a it. negative. Um, but so- the weird thing is where they put us into the like holding room, which is separate from the studio where they're filming. So we, they're trying to, they, first of all, they want us to create drama with each other That's and true. we're all professional comedians. We're not like those amateur, like, so we're all like, no, I'm not going to shit on my friends and yeah. no, I'm not going to give you tape of me shitting on other comedians. Are you out of your mind? So everybody's super positive, yeah. <laughs> which is weird for comedians, but we're all just sitting being very professional. So they're getting no drama. They're Plus I'm all like, like, I love that guy. Why don't I tell you? What do you, so everybody comes back and you go, how was your set? Nobody says they have a bad set because they don't want that to be on the tape. So everybody walks back and says they had the best set. So we're like, what the fuck is going on? So everybody's acting real weird. The only thing that kind of leaks out, like every once in a while you get like a bathroom break. So we're getting the real story like when we're not on camera. And everybody's like, everything is fine. Uh, I didn't understand a word Norm McDonald said to me. Like he's slurring. I think he's on something. I don't know what's going on. He was literally incomprehensible. I think he said something nice. I have no idea. They, we just, they rushed me out. So that's the only piece of information that's like kind of flying around friends. So they finally take you out. You don't, you don't get to know if the audience is hot. You don't know if other people have been killing. You can't hear. Everybody's saying, no, you're in another studio. Oh, entirely. Oh, oh. So everybody's coming back saying, I'm killing. And you're like, I don't know if that's true. Maybe it is. <laughs> that's true. Also, no comic. Wait, do you know if they're saying the also, truth? Also, is it is it 100 people for one, the same audience or they're splitting up audience? We don't know anything. We know. find out later they're paid extras, which is the, not the best scenario. Okay. I walk out and I murder. So I'm like, okay, this is great. I don't know if that means I'm murdering more than anybody else, but I'm having a really good set. And Jesselnick has to keep quieting the audience down because they won't stop applauding for me. I'm like, that's a good sign. How long a set were you supposed to do? It's like, th- it's three minutes and it's a hard three minutes. So they, that which was a little bit, I, I was fine. Like I timed my set out. And so I knew where I was going to hit. They don't give you a timer until I think it was, I want to say 30 seconds, but it might've even been 10 seconds. So you don't know what your oh timing is until you have 10 seconds left and you're fucked. Yeah. I have a stopwatch though. So I'm like, yeah. I don't care that I can't see the screen, but some other comics are like, wait, you're not just going to give me a, a shot clock basically. Yeah. So they're kind of going out of their way to make sure you get to that tense moment, right? They want you to kind of, yeah. so I do this at, it's great. Um, the audience is like on their feet. Like it's great. Um, Roseanne is like, I love you. That's like useless now. Cause she's been canceled out of existence. <laughs> Uh, but at the time, great. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> at the time, I'm like, yeah, Rose Amazing, loves yeah. me. Um, and then Keenan Ivory Waynes is like being very supportive. Norm does like a 10-minute incomprehensible monologue. And he starts talking about religion. And every time he says something. Because your joke, just to, just to, so people know, your joke uh, talked about people on the subway. I'm getting to an argument with a guy on the subway. And the whole idea is like he's very religious and I'm very secular. That's like the basis of the joke. And they edited out a few tags that I really liked. But that's. Fine, like that's. To well, be there's a, there's a comparison to of he's he's Harry quoting Potter his and the favorite Bible. book. Let me yeah. quote my favorite. Exactly, book. yeah. Um, so like, yeah. So he's like, well, if you know, J.K. Rowling was a Christian, and so like Harry Potter is a very Christian book, and so my line immediately was, I'm just comparing two works of fiction, Norm. The audience loses oh, it. Oh, that's a good line. Loses it. Yeah. Roseanne standing ovation. The crowd stands up because yeah. they've been listening to him drivel on and on and on. And so I murder. And then he, like, this keeps happening. He keeps coming up with a line and then I keep slamming him because yeah. I have, so, they, I'm only done a small chunk of my religion chunk, right? So yeah. he's just setting up more jokes in my set. Yeah. So I'm just slamming, right? Uh, but like, and it goes on for a really long time, like an uncomfortable long time. He keeps going. And half the things he says, I'm not understanding. We don't realize, I don't realize this until like years later when he came out, he's like, by the way, I had cancer and like he was going through treatments. I'm 95% confident he was in the, like the height of his treatment. Like I think he was on yeah. serious medication for 
that. And also with one thing we didn't find out until later also was that anybody who did really, really well, he was acting as a spoiler. Like he didn't want to be there. So anybody who did poorly, he was like, that's the greatest comic. And anybody who did well, he said that was the worst. And so he purposely always took the opposite take sure. of the audience, yeah. which we, you don't know that going in. So you're just like, what? Like I'm a huge fan of Norm, right? Yeah, like, of course. I'm like, what? So I walk off kind of feeling pretty great. Um, in the actual room. So we're waiting in another room. So we can see the feed where Anthony Jeselnik is reading the names. So when they say your name, the audience has to stop clapping. They grab you from the room. They have to take you from one studio to another studio. It's like a three minute run <laughs> before you can come out and be like, yep, that was me. So it's, it's a lot. So it takes like 40 minutes to read all the names. Yeah. But I'm, I, we're all waiting like, Oh God, are they going to call me? I'm the first name they read. And I'm like, Great. I don't even have to sit there and be like, oh no, is it going to be me? Is it not going to be me? I'm the first name, so there's no stress. I run around. Finally, when the episode airs, though, you'll notice they make all of these changes, right? So Norm says his line, which got booed by the audience. He gets a giant applause break, which he never got during his entire diatribe. Yeah. And then I just like make a face, like, oh. and then they move on. And then at the end of the episode, they, I'm it's it comes down to me and two other comics and I'm waiting there nervously and then they finally they call my name last and I was like they, they make they make you do all the stuff where they're like you're just sitting there nervously like we're just gonna record you waiting like they make you wait extra long before the first name yeah but so that's all artificial I was the first name called so like yeah. am I gonna make it yeah I fucking knew immediately yeah um and then the second set they couldn't get enough audience. So it's mostly dummies, which we couldn't, we didn't really know until the episode aired because they cut to the dummies. And we're like, that's why that audience sounded less loud than the first audience. Dummies, literal dolls? It's really dolls, yeah. And you can see it in the episode. They cut to the dummies at, like to be like, yeah, most of our crowd is dummies. So we're like, wow, I'm not killing as well as I did in the last one. Oh, maybe because there are literally, literally human dolls. Um, these shows, these yeah. shows, I, yeah. I, I feel like I'm almost thankful that I, didn't get America's Got Talent, and I don't know if I'd do it now, because I just, this shit sucks. Yeah. This shit sucks yeah. so bad. And there's a big risk, right? Because they can edit you. There's, yeah. They can edit you however they want. Big risk. Yeah. Did you, when it aired, because you're, you're, you don't show weakness. Yeah. Were you, were you hurt when it aired? Were you embarrassed? Were you pissed? No. If anything, I... No, because I, I, th I did those jokes because I feel strongly about them. Yeah. The irony was... All the all the sort of hate was people saying like, yeah, it's not brave to do religion jokes. And I was like, you're defeating your own point. The, the massive amount of vitriol and hate that I had to endure is proof that what I did was brave. Sure. Yeah. Right? Sure. Like weirdly, the more they said that, the more they were disproving their own point. Norm went a little bit weird on Twitter about it. We went back and forth because um, he was just like, he was standing by those like religious stuff. And then I just kept... Every time he tweeted something negative, I'd be like, so when am I opening for you? Uh, and it, that was like my, that was the running joke was like, you're right. But like, what dates? Like, I see you're in Miami. Like, can I fly yeah. out? Uh, like, that was the idea. Um, and then later on, I ran into him at Caroline's and we just like, I got a really sweet moment where he's just like, just so you know, you're like one of the best joke writers I've ever seen. And I was like, well, then fucking say that on camera. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had this like beautiful moment where I was like, oh, this is like how he is. Like when he was on the roast, he does like an anti-roast, right? Like remember when he yeah, does yeah, like yeah. for the yeah. birds, like wherever he is, he acts as a spoiler. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense to me. Um, I read that because him and Jesselnik, they didn't get along during well, that so taping. The thing about Jesselnik that was interesting, and I don't fault this for him at all, like, but he's trying to be Jesselnik, which is yeah. like very dark and one linery And that's kind of contrary to a game show, right? Sure. Especially last comic standing. So they come in the room. This is for the second set in particular. But they're like, hey, we have eight episodes. We have like barely any time to give you screen time. Don't riff on what Jesselnik says because we might have to cut it. Like, spoiler, they knew they were going to cut it because all of his sure. jokes were really, really dark. And he was really pissed about that. He wrote these like really dark jokes about every comic, which doesn't – we only got three minutes to go in front of the you audience. joke about you was? Oh, I'll never forget it. Tell me. So I'm a big Jesselnik. I'm not allowed – again, I'm not allowed to riff off of his joke. I have to just launch into my prepared oh, set. Oh, oh. So he comes out and he goes, oh, Harrison Greenbaum is next. His grandparents survived the Holocaust. Let's see if he can survive this set. And so then I just walk out and just ignore that. Oh, so it's, it's a what pretty have big said? hole. What would you have said? I mean, I would have at least acknowledged it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like I would have had, I would, or I would have changed to jokes that I have about that stuff. But I'm, I'm locked in a set and I can't even gotta, reference yeah. it. This was I when uh, I did the the JFL taping for Canadian yeah. set, 
and Mark Marin was hosting it, and and he should know better, but he, they gave him intros that they didn't run by any of us. Right. So so he brought me out. He, I think he said, "This next comedian's half Jewish, half Italian, and twice as neurotic." Ah. <laughs> and I was like, "What the fuck? Yeah. What the fuck?" Like, let me establish, like, it, Who I it, am. It, it, yeah. just like, kind of, it didn't ruin anything. But my first joke, the reveal was uh, that I'm a lanky Jew. And it was yeah. just like, just, I'm like, and I think with Rosebud, I have to ask Rosebud, where he said, like, Rosebud's parents were always proud of her doing stand up. And then she started to say, like, no, they weren't. What? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. it was, it was a total, it was so fucking weird. Yeah. All these shows. But they, we couldn't even acknowledge it. So it's like, here's a Holocaust intro. And then I just launch into my set. Yeah. It was, it was what weird. You said quick thinking. Nothing. I mean, he had to launch into a set. What would what you, would have, you have said? Oh, God. Let me think. <laughs> I would have freaked out. I would have followed sure. the rules, is what I would have done. Yeah. That is what I did. 100%. <laughs> if I bombed, I'd be like, oh, six million and one. Oh, oh, there we go. God, I mean, okay. I have the jokes in my act. So I always have been like, no, it's yeah, okay yeah. to make jokes about the Holocaust. Like, I asked my grandmother, is it okay if I make jokes about it? And she was like, what? And I was like, perfect. <laughs> I appreciate the support. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Your grandparents did survive the Holocaust. Both my grandparents. Oh. I mean, on my dad's side, yeah. yeah. Is that the only one Jewish? Like when they ask if they did survive, and I'm like, they had to have because yeah. they reproduced and made my dad. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, my grandfather was in Auschwitz. But your dad's Jewish, mom's not? No, no, both. Both, both are, Jew. okay. Yeah, Jewy Jew. They were in Auschwitz. My grandfather was in Auschwitz, yeah, and my Main grandmother one. was in Bergen-Belsen. Auschwitz, forgive, forgive me, Auschwitz. That's like the A club, do you know what I mean? Like, that's like the top level. And wh why? <laughs> Just they had, like, the better food? No, 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 no. Oh, no. I, meant like, you know, I know you're joking, but yeah. why is that the famous one? Because it was the worst one. It was the worst. It was a death camp. And the others were more... Some of them were more writers retreats. Camps. Yeah. <laughs> no, my, well, my grandfather was there for like, I think eight years. He was there before it was the death camp. He was one of the longest survivors of Auschwitz. Like, he was there when it was just a ghetto, then it became a work camp, then it became a death camp. And at that point... It was briefly a funny bone. Yeah, exactly. It was an Uncle Chuckle Fucks. And, uh, at, but at a certain point, he... Uh, but what is worth, uh, Auschwitz or a comedy condo? Uh, he, but he was working. Either one is Wi-Fi. He had a job. Right, exactly. Uh, he, was a, he had a job. So they were like, we could either kill him and then have to retrain somebody else, or we can just let him keep doing the job. What was the job? He would clean the trains out afterwards. <laughs> yeah, which is actually like, which is a fucking crazy job. But you, there were like cigarette butts left around by like the Nazis. And so you could trade those. And so that... It helped it, you know, as far as jobs go, it gave you something that you could trade. So it was like he saved a bunch of people's lives as much as he could. He how, like how, to, how do you save their lives? He'll be on the lines to be murdered. And he'd be like, that guy is, looks really perfect for this job. And he would make up a job and he couldn't do that all the time, but he would try to make up jobs and be like, I need that guy. Like that guy. He's my cigarette butt collector. That he's guy looks really like good. he could really help me with this thing. It was just to get people off the line. Oh, he's making oh. Sophie choices left and right. Left and right. <sighs> and then we didn't find out till later. So. Uh, we, they were always like, wow, he's so good with kids. And he really was really great with kids. Uh, my, my parents and then like us, he was really great with the grandkids. And, um, we, my, my family went to Jerusalem and that you, if you call them in advance, you can be like, Hey, my, my parents are survivors. Uh, our grandparents are survivors. Can you pull any records? Cause the Germans kept great records. So you could literally like pull of all the negatives. One thing they did well, <laughs> they kept a nice record. Uh. Uh, so you, they can pull everything they have pertaining to your family specifically. Like this is where they, you know, all this stuff. So they pulled all of the stuff for my grandfather and grandmother. And that was when we discovered that he had gone in with a wife and son. Wow. We didn't know. No way. And he had never really talked about, it, but they were murdered. Wait, and so you, you, so my dad and and uncle were his second and third kid, not wow. his first and second. So you went there with I actually, your grandfather and asked for these no, no, records? My, so my grandfather already passed away. Already passed and I actually away. didn't go on that trip. I had been to Yad Vashem, though. Uh -huh. um, but uh, that was my, my mom, sister, and dad went. And so they just said, hey, we'd love to see these. You get an email with a PDF or you see like the original papers? That's a really good question. I think you can. They pull whatever they can. So they have the originals. Oh, my God. That's yeah. crazy. And they... But you was can there see, anyone alive for them to talk to it about it, or they just knew this well, thing? Well, so then we now. asked my grandmother, who was still alive, like, did you know that, like, your husband, you're the second wife? And she's like, oh, yeah. Like, And we're like, you didn't want to tell us? Yeah. She was like, it's too sad. Why would I tell you guys? But she knew. Like, my, my grandfather had told my grandmother. Oof. But they just oh never shared God. it with us. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I was just in... It turns out the Holocaust, all I was, downside. I know, I was just spending time... My wife's grandfather was in Auschwitz. Yeah. So I was just was spending time with him uh, last week. 
and just insane. Did he talk about the first wife? Uh, no, he was too young. He he, but he lost. You know, he went with family members and yeah. and didn't leave with them. Right. Um, but uh, he uh, he was young. I think he was like in his teens when he went. Um, but only reason, like he, we found out from talking to him, the the reason he survived was because he was got sick when the Russians took over. So like they had sent him to the hospital wing of the thing and it was like it was at the very end of the war mm. when instead of getting sent on like the death marches and things it was like I'm impressed that they had well, a hospital yeah. that's wild yeah. what if your what if what if your grandfather pointed to oh yeah he looks real sick he got sent to the hospital yeah. and said oh forget about the wife uh, wild I uh oh my god yeah that is something it's and crazy and just well so the just <laughs> yeah <laughs> Jesselnick just brought up that drama right before my network debut uh, no, it was, it was weird. Um, <laughs> he could have said, well, like his, his grandfather didn't pick his wife to be saved. Let's see if the judges pick Harrison tonight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh man. So you, you went to Harvard. Um, that's cool. Uh, is uh, it? <laughs> it is. I'm so jealous. Are you Are really? You want to go to Harvard? No, not to Harvard, but to like to be... Yeah, it's a there, nice. There's there's a real comedy group yeah. to be in, and I know I you, was not part of I it. Know. That was the irony was like the Lampoon does like really produce a lot of people, but also it it gives you the networking right out of the gate that helps you a lot. Um, I never uh, did the Lampoon. I started a stand up club because that was what I was passionate about. So I started the the Harvard Stand Up Comic Society. So it was Harvard Sucks was the acronym. Right. Which the school didn't know about because I always wrote it out, and they brought me in, and they're like, "Oh, the name's got to change." I was like, "Shit, they figured it out." And they're like, "No, it's an undergrad group. It has to be Harvard College Stand Up Comic Society." <laughs> so I changed it real fast. So it was Harvard College Sucks, and they didn't figure out that that was the acronym until I made like a sweatshirt design, and you have to get that approved by the trademark office. So then I send in a sweatshirt that just says Harvard College Sucks on it, and they're like, "Son of a bitch!" <laughs> so I was like, "My own." That was an angry letter from the dean, but they they. My five year reunion, I, I saw that dean again, and he's like, officially, we had to send you that angry letter, but like, unofficially, funniest prank was ever pulled on us. Like, good work. Can you tell me about was this your thesis about race based humor's effect on prejudice? On prejudice, yeah. Did you hear about the one? I think it was a call. It was called. Did this you hear was... about the one? The effect of race based humor on prejudice? Yeah. But was this your your thesis? My psychology thesis. Yeah. Um, what was the the conclusion about it? So it it was. The the medium length version of it is well. The idea was, can humor change minds? There's a lot of research that it can. That like delivering your message through humor is far more effective than just delivering your message in a serious way. So there is like a uh, there actually the weird the funniest one is they were doing there was an old old study where they were saying like sexist things seriously and then doing a sexist joke and the sexist joke made people more sexist than the serious statement mm. and I was like use your powers for good man like that's the opposite of what you should that be was doing a study where was the old study, study. I've been I'm sure they were still smoking cigarettes kind of thing <laughs> Um, so I, I created what was called the humor function grid. Cause I wanted to try to divide up all the humor research cause there's a lot of it. And I did it by separating out target, uh, the sort of joke teller or deliverer and the audience. So like, imagine if it's like a male comic talking about men in front of all women, or is it, uh, a, you know, a male comic talking about women in front of all men, those would be different kinds of humor and have different effects. Sure. Um, so that creates a grid of four. Right. And then I was like, what grid has the least amount of research? tied to it. And that was where um, the joke teller and the subject are the same. So like a black comic talking about black people in front of a white audience mm. or a fat comic talking about fat people in front of skinny, a skinny audience. It was all in group, out group. So it didn't matter specific what the specific out group, in group. Shows. What? <laughs> <There's> a, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was the idea was that area of the human function grid. Um, sure. So uh, the idea was, what does it do to prejudice? And what I found was it just um, enhanced what was already there. So like, because Chris Rock had that black people versus N-word bit, very famous bit. He stopped Yeah, you were telling it. me that earlier today. Yeah, 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 yeah. The whole bit. Yeah. <laughs> but he stopped doing that bit because he, and same thing with Dave Chappelle is he stopped doing his show. His stated reason was he found white people were like, kind of taking it the exact wrong way. Like racist white people were like, see, I'm right. And he's like, wait, what? If that's how you feel about that, something has gone wrong. Yeah, that's a stated version. It, it seems really clean. It all seems like a clean narrative. Yeah, yeah, For yeah. The older I get, the more I'm like, I don't buy any single one of these narratives. Sure, sure, sure. But sure. Um, but the idea was 
those kind of when when somebody makes fun of their own group, people who are in the opposite group can either be like, see, like not all people are like that, right? Yeah. Or they can say, oh, see, I'm right. There are people who are like that. And that's for any in-group or out-group, right? So if a female comic is making fun of women in front of an audience of all men, the misogynist group can be like, see, some of those women are shitty. And the the people who are not misogynist can be like, see, that's the exception, not the rule. But then where was the where was the effect? How did you measure that? Was it based on post-interviews or like hate crimes or what? <laughs> exactly. I just studied. I just followed them for years. Um, no, actually, the funny thing was we, um, we did use Chris Rock. So we used that bit. And then we used a bit about him talking about fat people as the, as the control. Um, is he has a fat people joke. He does. Is it the one about how they have their uh, a, a bigger black woman has no. She no, feels ha- it had to have nothing with race. Oh, it had nothing to do with race. What is his fat joke? I I can't I can't remember it now. There was a joke that was like very cleanly not about race at all. So that was our control. I want to hear Chris Rock's fat joke. Uh, it was a good one, like most of the Chris's stuff. But um, we had there's this thing called the IAT, the Implicit Attitude Test, and the person who developed it actually was also at Harvard. So I got to like just literally like have a meeting with her and be like, can you help me? Which is crazy, right? Like she'd been at Oprah like two weeks before she had a meeting with me. And I was like, this is like, this is crazy that as an undergrad, I have access to this. So that, that would be the one, that would be like one of the main advantages of going to a school like that. But um, the IAT is an implicit attitude test. So the idea is even if you're not explicitly racist, you I still have implicit biases. Sure. Uh, and this test doesn't measure objectively, it's subjective. So if I gave you both the same IAT for race, I couldn't say if either of you are racist, but I could say one of you has more implicit biases than the oh, other. Oh, can we, can we find this test online? <laughs> it's online. Take it? It's 100% That's gonna online. It's going to be a Patreon oh episode. Oh, my God. Guys, join the Patreon, patreon.com. Slash you Johnson. absolutely could take this we, test. We, are you willing to take this test? Not publicly. And see who has more of an implicit <laughs> bias near you? <laughs> Well, let's see. And let's you can see do the these tests, first. by the way, for anything. So it doesn't have to be black, white. It could be like me, you, which is like like self confidence. It could be women, mm. male. It could be literally almost on any. What sort are you of most thing. comfortable with revealing? <laughs> like you do a self confidence one, right? So you could do me, you, and see who has a better these sort tests of. Tests are so hard though, because then you go deeper, and then you go. Some people are answering what they think will make them look yeah. good. So that's and- the whole thing about this test, right? Is that even when we tell you how the test works and like what it's measuring, the results are still pretty good. So that's the thing that psychologists will measure about their tests, like how yeah, robust yeah. are. The results. Sure. It's a really cool test. So basically, what you will see on the, we did it as a paper version, but you'll do it on the computer, which is better actually, because it'll measure like within seconds. Um, basically, we assign one button will be, let's just do the black white version because that's what we did. Yeah. So one version will be either black faces or white faces, or it'll be like black names, typically black names, typically white names. It's you can do it however you want, but let's say it's black faces, white faces. So they're photos, right? And so one button is if it's a black face and one photo is if it's a white face. And these are just photos. You're like, that's Caucasian, that's African American. Like pretty easy task, right? Uh, the other task is like good words, bad words. War is a bad word. Peace is a good word, right? Like sharing is good. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. violence is bad. So like very clearly ba- flower is good, right? Um, so we assign, we bind, uh, like for example, black word, black faces and good words might be one button and white faces and bad words are another button. And so we measure how long it takes you to do that task. Then we reverse it. So it's black faces, bad words, white faces, good words. And we find that. Oh, the task, that's, that is, that's, I can see how you we can't measure the discrepancy. That. So we find that regardless, black or white, this is what's so interesting, right? Whether you have a black or white participant, the task is easier when it's white, good, black, bad. Oh, no. It's easier in both versions, which says that there is some sort of like societal issue, right? Where like yeah. even the black participants are still finding white, good, black, bad easier. And this is in milliseconds, right? We're measuring That's the discrepancy. So funny. We got to do this test. I see Russell. Oh, oh. I'm practicing. And doesn't Late say, nights. by the way, <laughs> it's not saying, it's not saying whether you're racist. It's just saying one of you has less implicit bias. Yeah. You could both be very, you could both have very low levels Right? Well, I, I would say well, I, I'm yeah, associated too. Scale? But then I, wanna, I wanna make sure the black person is is keep them away from the bad thing. But so like, I wanna make sure I, I see it quickly. So I can go, oh, keep you away from the the bee sting. You can't game it. But uh <laughs> it would be like saying, like, if you were two Olympic runners and one of you is slightly faster, you're both Olympic runners. So yes, one of you might be faster than the other, but is that so like th- that's how I would approach that. Sure, if sure. You guys are comparing each other. You but, can't you can't game the test, but you can game the interpretation. All interpretations can be manipulated. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you, we can give you data, but what you do with that data is yeah, up yeah, to yeah. you. Yeah. So we basically gave people these IATs as a way to measure their implicit biases. Because explicit biases are different too, right? So you could be like sort of very internally racist, but every time you have that thought, you're like, I can't say that. That's a bad thought. Yeah. And so explicitly, and, and that's the other question. 
from a societal basis, our impl- if you never act on your implicit biases, which we probably argue that you probably are, but if you never act on them, does that really matter? Or is explicit bias the real explicit thing? Explicit you- would be like, here's the word violence. Do you want to drag it to the white face or the black face? That would well, be no, the implicit. Imp- the difference would be like, if I'm hiring somebody, if I, if I allow those implicit biases to affect how I hire people. And it's hard because sometimes it is subconscious, right? But like some people sure. won't go out of their way to overcompensate, which may be good, right? Where they're like, I know I might have a bias against non-Jews or whatever the hell it's going to be. So I'm going to make sure that like I'm going out of my way to almost weigh them more. Uh, this, is, this is maybe I shouldn't admit this. I was hiring a task rabbit. Yeah. And there was a white guy and a black guy. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'll hire the black guy. And I said, for the task rabbit, Jamarco, this is not an act of... Right, but you might have all. implicit biases and you're try to, trying to compensate no, for No, I was trying to just be good. I yeah. said, hey, give him a hand. Give us some money. They're on task, grab it. I'm doing a good thing. Yeah. So I'm not saying anything. So you would you would uh you would have them do that test, watch the Chris Rock thing, have them do the test again to see if it affected their we, well, so this is like an undergrad thesis. So we basically assume that most people at Harvard were uh, uh, like if you take a random selection of them and you do a random groupings. Their IAT should be like a random group of two random groups of Harvard students should have statistically similar levels of prejudice, right? If I do it f- truly randomly. Yeah. So a group of 10 Harvard students and then another random group of 10 Harvard students should be about the same, right? As long as it was 10 students in Boston, then it could be. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then that's why that's why you have statistical power, right? So you do 100 students, you do 1,000 students, and you make sure it's really, truly random. So the idea is let's assume – that that's one of the assumptions that I have to make. Then when I do the IAT at the end, if one group proves to have a much higher or lower IAT score after watching the uh, the the humor, the the race based humor versus a not something unrelated to race, then we're seeing an effect. That must be the result of the stand up and not just chance. So ultimately, the conclusion was like. This isn't good. If you're already racist, it's going to make you more racist. And if you're already inclined to be not racist, it's going to make you even less racist. So it's like a V. So what do you do? So what do you do with that knowledge knowing that? What do you do with that knowledge being a comedian and knowing that (laughs) that a lot of comedians would go, well, fuck you. I just trying to be funny. We we all know that's the that's a conversation. That's always that's been the conversation more and more as comedians with social media have a bigger fan base and and people are able to collectively the racists are able to be more collective via listening to the same podcast. Like, do you go? Oh, it is a bigger problem that does need to be discussed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I mean it's the Spider Man thing, right? With great power comes great responsibility. Sure. If you're talking to a group of people and they're listening to you, you. To some degree, you can't just be like, I'm just making jokes. Like you are you are a vehicle for ideas. And so it is your responsibility to make sure those ideas are, I think, a net positive on the world. That's why we try to keep our listenership low. Yeah. Because we want <laughs> right, no responsibility. We want. No responsibility. Yeah. A lot of race jokes. Um <laughs> uh, that's that's wow. that's fascinating. It feels that just is... so relevant. Cause I just feel like the whole we talk about it, and every time I talk about it, I feel like Jamarco, you're not being a comedian anymore. Where it's just like there is an we have to be able to talk about uh, what is the responsibility as these comics get more more popular. But the problem is to talk about it, then you're a nerd yeah. talking about comedians, and you're not convincing anybody. But yeah, I mean, especially if you have a very large audience, the idea is that you're saying when people are laughing, it's an agreement in some form. When you laugh at a comedian, you're saying. Those ideas resonate with me on some level. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think a comedian's doing as much damage as a politician who's passing a law that prevents sure. a thing, right? So, like, your joke, if your joke is pro life, you're doing less damage than an actual pro life politician. But, like, yeah, you're, it's about winning hearts and minds. I hear you. I, uh, before we go to our next segment, we talked, we talked a little bit about, by the way, people who listen to my episode, about uh, McDonald's, the, the code name that was for LOL Comedy Club. We recorded it like seven months ago when it was still open and it closed. So we used the code name for nothing. It was a big fucking pain <laughs> in the ass bleeping because we kept saying LOL by accident. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you, why did you want it. to bleep it? Just in case I needed to run some new material and I wanted to go back. <laughs> you wanted to keep it, the option open for sure. But you, you worked at LOL. You worked at Ha. I did work at Ha. And ha then LOL, to LOL. Yeah. I'm going to make a... Do- I'm saying right now, I want to make a 
a podcast documentary because I feel like <laughs> you do with the exact same tone of like the survivors of like trauma <laughs> and like like a war documentary. Like these are people that have come back from battle. And he thought his grandparents shit. had it hard in Auschwitz, but that's because <laughs> they had never heard of LOL. Yeah, you're like, and you can't respond to that intro. You have to just keep talking about it. <laughs> they, they, I mean, they also, we had to take the trains to get to LOL. There's a lot of parallels. <laughs> um, but you also, uh, a lot, some people thought that what I was talking about was Caroline's. Really? No, uh, that's totally different. It's totally different. But I think because we talked about being in Times Square. Ah. Uh, it did sound like you once, you once had a rough... Uh, opening set for a very late, maybe no show, Paul Mooney. Oh, well, so this, I, I, first of all, I love, loved, I, it's closed now, it's crazy. Love Caroline's. When I, when I was working at like the Haas and LOLs and stuff and just trying to build up, like, just build, be, be able to do jokes well consistently, when I finally got passed at Caroline's, it was like a big career moment and I, they enabled me to meet so many people. Like, it used had, to be like uh, hot. It was oh. the best. I was opening for everybody, like uh, Gilbert Gottfried, Kevin Nealon, J.B. Smoove. Wow. Um, I remember seeing Bill Burr right before he could sell theaters. Was J.B. Smoove as good as I, I've heard when he was like at his prime? He was a beast. A beast. Total beast. Mm. I remember one time it was Sam Morell and Michael Che opening for Jim Jeffries, and then I was opening for Paul Mooney, and we were all getting drunk together, minus Paul Mooney. And... Um, it was just like such fun time. It was heady times. We're like, man, we're really doing the thing. I remember being like, Michael Che, you're going to be way famous uh, before I am, if I ever get famous. So just like, can I be a, a crazy neighbor on your sitcom? And he's like, yeah. fuck you. You're going to be famous first. I'm like, no, no, no. It's definitely you. Uh, I'm still waiting for the call to be the crazy neighbor. Sure, sure. Uh, but that was I, I, a verbal contract. <laughs> um, and I have many family members who are lawyers, so I will be pursuing it. But um, no, the thing about, so like, uh, Louis Fran of the Booker w was always so great uh, at booking me for stuff. And I remember he, I got a call and he's like, do you want to open for a Paul Mooney? And I was like, fuck yeah. Like the godfather of black comedy. Like he's such a legend. Like he's in many ways, the reason Richard Pryor was Richard Pryor. Like he was there in Berkeley, you know, like it's amazing. Um, so I opened for Paul, had a great set. And then I started opening for him every single weekend he was there. So that would be like, uh, it'd be Fridays and Saturdays twice a month. Wow. So like two Every other weekend, essentially. What time did that Caroline. show start, though? That show started at 12.30 a.m. Oh, my God. Started at. Wow. If it was on time, which it never was. They don't really was. do that. Like, do the city just used to operate later? Like, yes. Because uh, John Stewart would always talk about doing the cellar at 3 a.m. And I'm yeah. like, 3 a.m.? No, I think everything closes late on the later. Weekends. It closes earlier, rather. Um, but the funny, what I found out later is after I started opening for Paul Lott, was that Lewis was like, hey, I have this guy, Harrison. He'd, I'd like to have him open for you. And Paul's like, "Like this white kid? Like, Are you out of your mind? And to Lewis's credit, he goes, give Paul, give Harrison one chance. And if he sucks, you'll never see him again. And to Paul's credit, he was like, okay, fine, one show. And if he sucks, I don't, like, that's it. And I did my first set, and Paul's like, anytime he wants to open for me. So, like, to both of those guys' credit for even giving me the chance. Yeah. Um, but, they were, I mean, that's an aggressive crowd. That's, like, a crowd that's there to see Paul. Um, and I knew I, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't know whether I, I did a set that Paul liked because if I had a bad set, he would give, he would say, give it up for the brave little white boy. And if I had a good set, he'd be like, give it up for the Jew. And then he would do a whole joke about how Jews are not white. He'd be like, oh, you think Jews are white? Like t send them to a Klan's meeting. They'll, they'll tell you how white Jews are. And as a way of like including me. Um, but Paul was always, Paul would be late a lot, like a lot, lot. So I would, the show was supposed to be at like 12.15. We would start it at 12.30 to give him a 15-minute window. And then I would have to keep going until the light went. So I was supposed to do 15. My record was 70 minutes. <gasps> and sometimes at a certain point, he really trusted me. So like I had been on stage for like 45 minutes. And then I would see Paul watching my set, laughing, eating a shrimp cocktail. And I'm like, I'm... You, it's your turn. Yeah. And he would just be like, no, no, keep going. Like, I trust you. Like, I'm like, okay. Like, it's an honor that he would sit there and like watch me. And like, his laugh was one of the most famous laughs. Um, what was it like? Tell me. Oh, God. Well, Paul described Richard's laugh as like, it's the thing you worked for. It was like a beautiful laugh. Like, it was loud and you felt like I'm doing something correct. Yeah. And Paul had this big laugh and his whole face would light up. You could Google it. Like when he's doing, he does a roast of Richard Pryor on like the last episode of the Richard Pryor show. And you could see that laugh. It's like, it, it's a big laugh and it's Paul Mooney. So I'm like, man, I'm doing something right. Yeah. Um, but there was one time where I had done 70 minutes 
And um, they passed me a water, which I was like, I don't need a water. I'm doing fine. But there's like a napkin underneath it. I'm like, what? And I see on the napkin, it says, we found Paul. He's in Berkeley. He had never gotten on the plane. (laughs) So I had to like tell the audience like, hey, so you just got 70 minutes of me. We're going to put up this other guy that we found at the bar across the street. Because we, uh, the manager had run to the playwrights to see if there were any comics still hanging out. He did 15 minutes. Um, Wait, so you didn't you didn't announce you didn't have announced yet that Paul wasn't there? No, I go all right. Here's our next comic because I knew it was. I bring up the comic. He did a joke about Harry Potter. The audience didn't laugh, and what he meant was like, oh, he said like he meant like the audience, like you guys are not here for a joke about Harry Potter. But he said you people, and he was a white comic. Oh. And it's an almost entirely black crowd, so he was like you people wouldn't get it, and they thought he meant like black people oh. don't read, which is not the intention. But I was like, a murder is about to fucking happen. Like, so they were like lighting him, like, get him the fuck off the stage. Like, he this has made the situation even worse. So I went on stage. I had to be like, yeah, by the way, also, we can't refund you any of your food or drink, but like we can refund you your tickets. You people Paul's are screwed. Yeah, you people are screwed. <laughs> the audience. Um, so that was that was pretty rough. Who is that comic? I'm not gonna say because no, I just I say it. He was uh, he was a good comic. He just he had well, never if, opened for that crowd. He did you say that doing. one moment? Did you have to say, "Hey guys, Paul"? After that guy got off. <laughs> after he got off, you had to say it. Yeah, I did. Like, what was hey, well? How do you? How do you? Paul's not it? gonna make it. Audience is like through. I'm like I have like this. You know, I got I got a couple more jokes. If you want to stick around and if you uh, take care of your servers, they worked really hard for you. And I hope you guys can come in a couple oh. weeks when Paul's here. Yeah, it's rough. Oh. Did you do those jokes or did they just storm out? No, I did the jokes. and <laughs> Yeah, it was not easy. <laughs> did they like you making fun of Christianity too? Were you really doubling down? Oh, yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> a whole audience of Norm MacDonald's. Uh, well, oh, by the way, Norm MacDonald died on my birthday. So if, if anybody's wondering who won <laughs> or if God chose a side in the end, Norm died on my birthday. And every comic on the planet texted me. It was like, I guess your birthday wish came true. <laughs> <laughs> Do DeSantis next or whoever. Um, let's go to our next segment. This got to stop. <laughs> this has got to stop. Wow. Comics were heartless. Yeah. Um, Russell, do you have this got to stop? Yeah. Uh, this is, goes out for the um, people on the road. You know, we don't, we don't drive that much here. Mm-hmm. But uh, people driving on, you know, taking road trips. This has got to stop. Um, you see an exit. It says, hey, you want a Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks here? Take this exit. <laughs> okay. You, you've you got my attention. I was looking for that. I need a coffee. You get off. It's not there. It's not there. It's three miles away. It's not. It's or it's five miles away. Mm. You ha- It can only be within a mile. I think the rule is if you're gonna put it on the highway and you're gonna advertise it and you're gonna tr- convince me to take time off of my like a road trip to stop and get off, then it has to be a mile. But this this ten mi- ten minutes, fifteen minutes to get the, you know that's not there. Well, you don't get to advertise for it. Sure, sure. So that is the thing uh, uh, lately I've been noticing where I will try to be able to see it, spot it from the road. But sometimes you just have to trust them because the time goes on and you need to stop. And um, I feel like it's something that you it, there needs to be a limit. One mile. You can advertise up to one mile of business. There must be a law. On the highway. I'm curious what it is. We should look it up. Just the other day I was in upstate New York and it told me there's a Dunkin' Donuts here. And I got off, and I, I was like, well, I don't see it. And I said, go that way. And I put it, I started to go that way. And then I was like, I'm just going to put it in 12 minutes away. No. That is not. Acceptable. That's a 30-minute thing that you're adding to getting off of a highway. That's crazy. Speaking of Dunkin' Donuts, that was one of the roast jokes I had for that, that bachelor party. I said, Gary's the kind of guy you don't want in front of you in line at Dunkin' Donuts. He can never decide how he wants to get diabetes. <laughs> he didn't like that. I think that's the one that made him go, okay, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> Enough with the fat <laughs> jokes. Okay. Um, uh, my this has got to stop is I was I went to the cellar, uh, uh, McDougal Street bathroom. I was washing my hands. I don't think I've ever noticed this before. So there's the mirror, the regular mirror. Mm-hmm. There's a mirror in the back. Oh, I've been saying this for years. So I got to see a fresh shot. I, I just got like a, sh- a, a shorter haircut and I was like, Oh no! I've been saying this for literally years. I love the cellar so much. Those the two mirrors where you can see how bald you are, 
that's the one thing that's got to change. It was a slap in my fucking yes. face. Because it was like, I, I, I had like a like a patch and I started using the spray. Yeah. But this was like a new like lime. Oh yeah. Like a hairline. You can't avoid it. You can't you can pretend with a front facing mirror that you're doing fine, but that back shot, my God. And I don't know whether I'm like either doing it everywhere so I get to get some heads up, so to speak. Yeah. I uh, and so I said to Tov, I said, you know, please can you tell me when you think I need to start planning the surgery? Right. And she said, Do you promise when I do, you won't get mad? And I said, No. She said, I mean, right what now. Surgery? <laughs> the 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 assisted the suicide. Plugs. Oh, <laughs> uh, the hair plugs. You're gonna do that? How every, often, do every, people do everyone's that? Everyone's doing it. Yeah, everyone everyone's doing, doing it. Everybody's doing it. Really? Everyone's doing everybody's it. Doing really? It. I have no idea. Yeah, you got fucking. Everybody's it. done it. Do you, really? you do it? I'm gonna do it. I think. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's. It's why not? And you can. You can't tell. No. Honestly, so many people are doing it that like I can think of like five comics off the bat who have a chunk about their hair surgery. Wow. Sometimes I'm like, I need to do it now before it becomes too hacky to talk about. That's right. There's a I lot to go through for no jokes. I thought you were going to say, like, wouldn't shave at all. Like, because you know, that's the other option. Oh, God, but I can't imagine. I don't, fully think, bald. I don't think Jews. I don't think I have a good head for that. Oh, I know I don't. I had You've to do it. it. Yeah, for a play once. It was awful. You mean the one in fifth grade? No. Were, oh, no, 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 ones? no. Like a Shakespeare thing. But, anyways, it, uh, not, it was not good. So need the hair. That's my this gotta stop. No one needs to know. If I'm tall, there's so few people seeing it. I'm mad at my opener. He's seven feet tall. He should have given me a heads up. Hey, buddy, not looking the view's not so great these days. <laughs> I'd be like, you're never opening for me again. I'll tell you that right now. Um, do you have a this gotta stop? Oh my god, I have so many. Go for it. I uh well this is gonna sound I have talking to the dead as number one. Wow. This is like a magic trick. I predicted all of the topics. Chiropractors are up there. But talking to the dead, have you seen it more recently? Or like it's well, there's just... that Tyler Henry guys. Every time I think it's done and we've debunked it, another guy springs up. What's so funny, other than the fact that we once had a psychic on the show, because I thought it I thought it'd be like a cute. I thought like I this is the foolish thing, yeah. what I've learned with the podcast. I thought I could poke, you know, I could poke at them. No, they but can't I was like, allow oh, it. I can't undermine someone's whole Their profession whole thing. politely. Yeah. 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 Uh, but what's so funny is there's some comedy clubs where psychics hit as one of their stops. Yep. I was at the Funny Bone in Ohio yep. and they're doing the ads before the show. Comic, comic, psychic. Yep. Yeah. And I also like what's what's like uh, I, I just love the idea that if you could really talk to the dead you should be the most famous person in the world yeah. one would think. But to have like a, a you're working a B room as a psychic, like, <laughs> like you you can talk to the dead, but only like uh, your your loved ones and neighbors. Like right. you're not quite yeah. good enough. Yeah. But it's so funny to be like, oh, we we're doing the same we're doing the same thing. Yeah. We're doing yeah, the crowd same work. Thing. People who are really good at crowd work. That's the funny thing is like when we talk about cold reading. I know so many comics who when they walk in the room like, oh, are you a teacher? Like, oh, are you this? And they're correct. Yeah. When you start hitting frequently. You could the transition from that to fake psychic is yeah. minimal. Yeah. You minimal. Should, you yeah. should try because you because you're, you're able to do it. If you could do crowd work, and as you're doing crowd work, s eventually move into like, wait a second, I'm seeing like at a comedy <laughs> show, yeah. and you can make one person cry. Oh, that's. I've like, always oh, wanted yeah. to do a, a a sketch about a psychic because I think it's so funny that it's always good news. It's always positive. It's never like, oh, uh, we found your grandfather and he hates thinks, you. He thinks you should lose some weight. You know what I mean? Like, it's never like yeah. how you sometimes interact with older family members. Just you know fat what I mean? shaming like, ghosts, every single one. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, like, well, body standards were different oh, back okay, in the you know, or he's still racist. You're like, Ooh, you know, like, like there's, it's always like, no, they love you so much, and right. they're blah blah blah. You know, like, uh, yeah, just a realistic type of I thing. Do like yeah. Some of them give you advice though and that infuriates me. They're like, your grandmother yeah. is saying you should take that job or like whatever oh, it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like changing yeah. someone's life. Yeah. Do not if they make a choice based on your bullshit, that's... But here's my question. If they if they were going to make a choice based on that bullshit, uh, were they going to make a good choice to begin with? True. No, but like I really think if you, if you convince this person that you're like, if you really would have taken the advice from your grandmother and that's why you're taking it because you think it's from your grandmother... Like you're taking advantage of that person. Here's, if if a comic actually did cold reading, every ghost would be like, "You, your grandma saying, buy all the merch." <laughs> yeah. Um, were there any more chiropractic? Oh my god, there's covered? so many. Keep going. Um, buying dogs instead of rescuing them, not to be that person, but like, 
you don't need a pure breed. What are you like a Nazi? Like you can have a dog that's mixed. Like yeah. re- there's so many dogs. Also, to the rescue. pure breed breads come with issues a lot of times too because they're purebred. They're like you know they have. I think if you if you don't like, like, if you adopt like your dog family. if you don't adopt your dog you shouldn't be allowed to even talk about your dog. I don't want to see. I don't want to see pictures. I don't want to see pictures. Is that what you mean? They have issues because of like yeah, like they have like inbred thing. Like if you're a purebred, like the you're, royal yeah, family. Yeah, they have like royal family. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah I don't, I don't want to know about your dog if you bought it. Yeah. I don't think I want to know. Um, no, that's uh, right. Posting pictures with someone you met once when they achieved something. Oh yeah. Okay. Magicians do it all the time. If some magician like, because there's like magic conventions, so you can take pictures with anybody. But like, I remember when like Shin Lim won AGT, so then everybody posted their one picture with Shin yeah. Lim. Like, so glad he did it. Like, you met him randomly one time. You're not his best friend. You don't get to like. That's not your. There was, so a, there was a lot of that flowers. from Gutenberg that I'm just waiting to to, to review. You know, from, he, he, <laughs> I, I, I did when I did Gutenberg every night they had it was a, a new celebrity, camera, yeah. yeah. And so I have a random picture with everybody with with one picture, and people are like, was that so cool? And you're like, most of the, once in a while you get to talk to people for a while, but most of the time it was a ten to twenty second conversation yes. where then they were like. Let the the photographer's like now we'll get our photo like it, that's all it was you know what I mean but like yeah they do it for the, they do it for deaths they do it for accomplishments days. that you know you, too bad you won't get to do one uh, you know when Hillary Clinton passes oh yeah because you didn't get that photo ah shit she got like, out of that celebrating one celebrating that you met the person for ten seconds I know you deserve nothing for that I know but people they, do it with deaths a lot too they did it with Shane Gillis with SNL yeah, yeah which if you're his actual friend then God bless but like if you just met him one time we don't need to hear that story that he like passed you in the bathroom line yeah sure how does that connect you to him in any way let him have let him have his flowers but you deserve nothing nothing <laughs> okay I like it you uh, got one more being early that's just as bad as being late fuck you. Okay, I, I agree. agree, but it's especially if it's for like a house party or like a, a oh, something. Man. At for your... podcast is very stressful when I'm not set up. If someone's yes. early, you and were right on time. Like if you if you want to be ten to five to ten minutes early, I I'll give you that. But if you got there more than five to ten minutes early, That's... just get a coffee. Like walk yeah. around the block. I hate when you're meeting up with somebody. They're fifteen minutes, twenty minutes early, half hour early, and they go. Hey, I'm here hey, already. I'm here already. No rush. Fuck you. You you want me to rush a little bit. Yeah, you absolutely want me to rush a little bit. You wouldn't yeah. have sent me that text unless you wanted me to know that you're already there. So I hurried up a little bit. I don't want you to listen to this part at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's different here. Like, I mean, because this is a studio, so I feel like comfortable coming here to work. If I was early, I'm never here. You don't text. I'm trying to get him here. Even no, earlier. I have keys, so it's different. yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Um, People who say big anything like big pharma, no, <laughs> no. You don't get to do that. You don't get to, oh, that's your whole argument, that it's big? That yeah, no sure. big company has ever done anything good ever because they have the resources and time? Sure. My, you don't get my, to say big pharma. And then I, big far- <laughs> oh, big anything now. Oh, big agriculture. Big blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. It's also, I feel like mainstream media is a, is a way of saying uh, big yeah. media. That's your whole argument, that it's mainstream, that lots of people listen? That's your main argument? Yeah. <laughs> that's why I can't listen to them because everybody else does? Yeah. I like that. I like that. Um, uh, let's go to our final segment. Oh, wait. Let's, can I oh, rile you up with one more? One yeah, more. Go please, for it. Please. This needs to be said. Do it. If I post my tour dates or I post where I'm going to be and you comment underneath, how about this other city? Yeah. Fuck you. I understand it's coming from a good place, but it's not the time. Yeah. I'm going to be here in Utah. What about Florida? This isn't a post about Florida. No. Yeah. You no. know what? I, when I start ending my announcements is after the toy dates, I'm going to list all the places I've just been. And, oh, that's and so, the worst one. Because it's, all, it's always that. Uh, when you're like, when are you coming to Chicago? I was and just like, there. Bitch, I was just I was there last weekend. And there were start. seats available. You should yes. start listing the places you'll never go to. Oh, yeah. They also list the place. <laughs> here, here I'm not the place, going there. Just so you know, here, here's the places I'm never going to go to. How about this place that's so, five hours yeah. from the nearest airport? No, you drive to me. <laughs> I am so sorry you live in an a town that, if you're more than a couple hours from the airport that's on you <laughs> yeah. you did that to yourself can I steal that I'll add that yeah please here's yeah. where I'm never gonna go to be. here's, where yeah, here's a list of places I won't list be. I won't go to no 
Uh, if I said, hey, I'm going to vacation in Hawaii, nobody would ever post underneath it, how about uh, the Philippines? Yeah. No. Yeah. If you wouldn't post that under my vacation, <laughs> don't post it under my tour yeah. dates. This is about positive affirmation. You should be like, wow, that's so cool you're going to those places. Not, How come you're not coming to my city? Yeah. No. Maybe I will. You will. There's also a degree where I'm like, especially at this stage of my career, like, if you really want me somewhere, you can make it happen. Yeah. You, you, you yeah. Raise some money. And you you can force me to go almost anywhere right now. If you can get a hundred people together, I can probably get there. Yeah, probably. but if it's just you, I ain't coming. Yeah, unless it's a private bachelor party for six. Unless it's six people on the butt end of <laughs> Long Island. <laughs> uh, final segment. You better count your blessing. You better count your blessing. Uh, my blessing. Um, I. Uh, there's so many people to be thankful for. Um, I'll do a double. Paige Asachika is stole mine. Okay, you keep it. You keep it. <laughs> okay. I'll do a different one. Okay. Uh, I got to see Oh Mary Cola Scola. Oh, so oh. I'm going to say it now, just in case they cancel on me. Cola Scola is going to do the podcast next week. Next week, oh. unless they cancel. Uh, but we but saw. If they cancel, no worries. <laughs> A little worries. Oh, no, a little worries. I'm just not, you know, it, it could be reality. People could be listening to this and they then will when they see next week. before this comes out. It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we got to see Oh, Mary. Oh, so um, good. It was so good. Yeah. It was so good to be reminded, like, just just how, co- how funny a comedy can be and well acted. And then the the blessing part, though, is I went with Russell and, and Douglas and we saw you there. But, the, you know, I said, let's go to the cellar. I never, I never get to, like... Bring my people to this. I haven't done that yeah. yet. And and Russell, you said he said, Ugh, I don't want to see stand up comedy. And I said, <laughs> Russell, we're not going to watch stand up comedy. We're just going to sit. And we got there. And Lisa Traeger, who did the pod, she yeah. sat down, joined us. You came over. Uh, uh, Joyelle, we saw Joyelle. All these people came over. Roy Wood Jr. Was like, it was a good, it was, it was a good it was a feeling nice... of like. I hope it was fun for you guys. It was. Like Douglas said to me, "Is like you must like this," and it's like, yeah, I do. It's fun to be yeah. like, hey, it was. You're cool. And uh, it was it was just nice to blend the two worlds, and I hope I I do that more. No, it was a really nice night. I was glad that you made us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was gonna shout out Paige, our producer, who is moving to California, and we had a really lovely meal with her last night. Uh, for Horsemen. Four Horsemen in Brooklyn, and uh, That's how we get sponsors, great meal. You got to say this. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we are just so thankful for her, and um, we're gonna miss her. Yeah, we're gonna see it. We're gonna we're be gonna in LA see more. Her. Yeah, but. we're gonna be in LA May third. Remember, get those tickets. Link in yes. description at the Comedy Store Original Room. It's insane that we got this Friday night, seven p.m. Yes. May. And then after 3rd. you see that, you can go see us in Uncle Function. I forget where that is, but Westside Theater. It's gonna be sold Theater. out. It's sixty five seats. Same, we'll same night, same two shows. Um, all right. Do you have a blessing for us? Well, one thing is, I love that my phone case matches Russell's shirt exactly. Yeah, it does that's wild? It does. I have to do laundry. I'm running low. <laughs> I'm in the summer shirts. I mean, yeah, it really it is. It looks good, though. <laughs> but it's a perfect match for my phone case. Uh, I, I would say that uh, the main thing, being in New York City, I know that's a little bit generic, but I sure. just got back from uh, almost two years in Las Vegas, and I really think that anybody who's complaining about New York needs to take a gap year. Because once you take a gap year, either you realize New York City is just not for you, and then you never come back, great. Mm-hmm. But if you come back to New York, you will realize you're in the greatest city on earth and you will never leave. I want, I, I remember we moved back. We were like on a plane and I was like, I plan on dying in New York city. This is the greatest place. And not being in New York for, uh, for almost two years made me appreciate it so much more. Mm. Um, what, the, what about it? Tell me every help me fall back about in it. Love. There's nothing good outside of New York. No, uh, <laughs> I don't like the lifestyle outside of New York. I don't want to drive. I love running around. I think the comedy scene in New York is unmatched. Running around, doing spots, the speed of stuff. Um, I don't need a big place. I like a smaller place. I don't need a house. I like. I don't need to have to. Oh no, I forgot something, and then run up two stories oh, we to just grab something this. from your bedroom. I love it. I, I love being near my family. I love bagels. I love good pizza. I love that there's culture. There's Broadway theater. Everything is in New York. And like you go to Las Vegas, I was doing a show that was a New York themed Cirque du Soleil show in a New York themed hotel. And so the level of mind fuck that I was experiencing, missing New York and being in a fake New York in a fake New York 
was on a, a like level. New York themed hotel. Like, do they have like a heroin addicts like in the? Well, the no, funny thing like is, the... New York, New York is. I lived in the hotel for like a month and a half when I started my run before I found like a place that I could move into, and they have a roller coaster wrapped around it. So you hear the screaming, and I'm like, that honestly, that fits. <laughs> yeah. The scream, the periodic <laughs> screaming, does bring me back to New yeah. York. That feels very authentic. Yeah. There was a guy. He was in the street. He was having like a. He was on heroin or something. But you know where you're fully bent over. Oh yeah. And he was like no. in the street, and I not from personal experience, but yeah, yeah. yes, I'm aware. <laughs> but I I tapped him, and I said, "Hey, you want to move it just a little bit to the sidewalk?" And I swear to God, he like got up and he was like, "Oh, thanks, man." Went to the I sidewalk. Know, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, right back over, oh, and I was like, "Man." No, I mean it, it helped him out, but but it was it was wild to see him like he was able to snap out of it for like three seconds and then moved. And then had his trip in the oh. sidewalk. Uh, he, he looked like he was on a better time than I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, New York, just the way you experience New York, you walk outside your door, boom, restaurant, bar. I know. It's Everything is here. It's That's, the greatest. It's a good blessing. So this is coming out in, uh, boo, 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 boo. This is coming out March 12th. What would you like to plug? Oh, uh, me. Um, I would like to just plug my social media because you can get all my dates there at Harrison Comedy on Instagram, TikTok. I think we call it X now. Um, my website is harrisongreenbaum.com. You can find all my tour dates there. And my book is called You Are All Terrible, The Book. Um, it was published by Tannins, which is the oldest magic shop in America. Um, and they do a magic camp every year called Tannins Magic Camp. I was a camper, now I'm a counselor. Um, so I always say support your brick and mortars. Um, but yeah, tannins.com, you can get the book there. A bunch of other magic stores are selling it as well. But just support like, uh, but support magic stores and magic. That's cool. Um, but You Are All Terrible is the book. And uh, if you Google it, you'll be able to find it or get it through my website, harrisongreenman.com. There's a link you can click it and get the book there. I went to a great magic store at the Seattle market. In Pike Street, yes, Pike Marketplace, yes, is it? It's run by Vanishing Ink now, I think. Oh, right? is it? There was an old, it was an old store, and then these those guys who are great, they bought it, um, and uh, yeah, they're keeping it going, which it's I think so is cool. awesome. I love magic. Uh, what do you want to plug? Uh, well, I'm back in Titanic um, until April 21st. So if you are interested, come see me in that uh, at the Dale Roth Theater. And then just know I'm I'm not doing the show March 13th through the 18th because we'll be in LA. Doing the downside live and then, on Thursday, March fourteenth. I think it's sold out, but maybe just try to come anyways. And then uh, May third. Oh, and we're doing shrooms. Oh yeah, this could be our last episode. Could be our last episode. We're doing shrooms in the desert. And then um, May third, we will have both the downside live and Uncle Function same night in L.A. Can you imagine if you do shrooms tickets. and in your trip you go? I don't want to do the podcast anymore. <laughs> 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 Wait, John Mario, before you plug, what, what is happening in your with your pants situation? So people think it's like they're like as if I'm like trying to show off. Like, yeah, I'm like, ooh, let me give <laughs> them are. a calf. I I I think I have sensitive skin. Okay. But like, only in one leg? No, but it's just like I like I just need a little bit to breathe. It just feels good. I used to roll up my sleeves in class in my in like high school. My teacher yeah. would be like, "Whoa, Jamarco showing off his guns," and I had no guns in high school. <laughs> uh, like most high schoolers these days. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, now when a teacher says you're showing off the guns, they have to hit an emergency button under their desk. Um, this is what I want to plug. I will be in uh, Columbia, Missouri, March 21st, um, and then the weekend after that, I'll be in San Diego, March. 29th and the 30th and then uh just to keep these going this is the netflix is a joke festival i will be on may 2nd headlining uh the masonic lodge some tickets available but get them now may 2nd and then may 3rd the downside live at the comedy store 7 p.m at, and the uh, uncle function after that everything in the comments check it out follow harrison follow russell uh uh and then you know oh last thing i want to say because you're my third magician on. Third. 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 Wow. Third. Who's? Matt the Knife. And then you weren't there for oh, okay. uh, your pal, Justin Wilman. And then uh, uh, they, if I want a magician to do a trick, it's the same way as when you ask a comedian to do a joke. Well, the thing about magic, though, in particular, so if you said just do a joke, there's jokes that are off, off the top of your head that you could do. Yeah. Magic requires, good magic generally requires prep. So definitely, like, in advance is helpful because, like, magicians, 
they're a really good trick. You want to like t- pen teller teller of pen and teller. I think he's the one who has the quote that like sometimes the secret to a magic trick is just like spending way more time than a human being should spend time on a thing. Yeah. And so yeah, that that definitely helps. So you don't have a trick on you right now? No, I didn't put anything in my back pocket. <laughs> it's How like will that it old story. On audio, anyways. This is the downside. That's true. We could just describe me doing a miracle, and no one would know. Oh my god! Oh my god! Where did that god. rabbit wow. come from? What? Four Whoa. rabbits now? You're Seven. To the downside. And now your knee's bleeding. A miracle. With John Marco Cerezi.